Hey everyone, it's Jim from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today, in tube lab number 69, we're going to talk about how to achieve great sound, starting with a look at analog source material. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Now, you might say, hey Jim, what source material got to do with great sounding tubes and tube amps? Well, if you don't know how to choose good recordings, it doesn't matter how good your gear is, it will sound just as bad as the recording you're listening to. Nothing can fix a bad recording. So, everything starts with the recording. How you play that recording is much less important, though still important, than the actual recording. And here's the sad truth. Most recordings are crap. In the old days, the 1950s and 60s, they may have gone cheap on the microphones, or worse, purchased the cheapest bulk tape they could find. And later on, after the introduction of the CD in 1982, a lot of music got remastered poorly, with everything given a giant EQ boost, and the results may have sounded great over a cheap set of headphones, but not on a highly resolving stereo system. Stay far away from those remasters. Okay, forgetting all the crap, many recording studios had excellent equipment and highly experienced staff, and when they got a chance to record an amazing performance, they did everything they could to capture it. It doesn't matter if we're talking about a 1950s Columbia, 1970s EMI, or a modern ECM recording session, those people cared about what they were doing, and the results reflect this. So you have two main analog paths to collecting great music. Reel-to-reel -reel tapes, which are expensive and, in my opinion, impractical for most of us, that leaves the LP, or Long Playing Record, today simply called vinyl. Let's take a look at some great records. This is an original Canadian press of Miles Davis' Round About Midnight, recorded only two years before Kind of Blue. Now, we're not going to go into the details as to how to figure out what press you actually have, but this is an early Columbia Center, or label, and there's all kinds of stuff online as to how to figure things out. This was a lucky find. When I first played it, it sounded good but very noisy. It took three cleanings in, uh, in a record cleaning machine, uh, and not an expensive one either, just one of those little things you operate by hand, a little bath of, of uh, cleaning solution. And after that, it, it quieted down substantially. So don't give up on old records, clean them first. And it, the water in that bath was unbelievable. It looked like Coke by the time I finished cleaning this record. That's because in the 1950s, well into the 60s, everybody smoked at home everybody, and we didn't know how to take care of our records, me included. Okay, up next, we've got Roberta Flack's first record from 1969. And this is the first press, you can tell by our center. And this is an Atlantic, and Atlantic really cared about their the quality of the recordings and their artists, and they did a great, great job. And even though this is not an audiophile recording, it sounds really good. Here's something that everybody who's into rock will recognize. This is a early press. I forget if this is a US or Canadian press. One of the things I want to talk about, and don't want to forget, is that the very best pressing is going to be the earliest pressing and the one closest to the master tape. So, if the master tapes for um, Led Zeppelin, for example, were in London, let's say, and that's probably where they were, 
the UK pressing, the first UK pressing is the one you want. But if you can't afford it and you, or you can't find it or both, uh, a first uh, American or Canadian press will be the next best thing. Ah, everybody recognizes this one. Now, this is actually a UK first, but it's not the stereo version. Have a look at the label down here. SQ. This is the quad version. Now, you might say, Jim, why in the world would you be interested in a dead format? Quad, of course, is a four-channel uh, format that was encoded on records, but quad records are designed to be played proper. They can be played back properly on a stereo system, and they sound great. They, often are a different mix, and maybe there's some sonics that are a little bit weird, but generally speaking, um, they can be played and they sound really good. Now, why am I fooling around with a first press, a first UK Dark Side of the Moon in quad? Well, I can't, I'll never be able to afford the UK first. I had a Canadian first. Um, I bought it for, I, I can still remember walking into the record store with my friend on a Saturday morning and plunking down my six bucks. Yep, it was five ninety nine. <laughs> Back in the day, that was huge money. Um, we had to think twice about whether we could afford a double album. They were fairly rare because most people didn't want to pony up 12 bucks for a double. And um, we would often, both of us would buy the same record on sale and we'd haul it back to one of our homes and play it to death, of course. Um, but uh, can you imagine I was able to buy a first Canadian press for five ninety nine? Um, now, what this gives us, for especially for a hard-to-find first press, what this gives me is about as close to the master tape as you can get because... Pink Floyd thought in quad. They actually performed in quad. Um, that's how they set up their sound system. And shortly after they pressed the, the first UK stereo release, they actually had mixed down, or mixed up, however you want to look at it, remix would be a better way, uh, a quad version. And this, this record sounds closer than any version I've ever heard to the master tapes, including a reported digital copy of a second generation master tape. It just sounds absolutely clear and clean and crisp. My favorite. <laughs> okay, now you may not like Nana, or you may well do. She has an amazing sing singing voice, but what most people don't realize that she is that she had, because she was an international star, she had an amazing backup band and they played a lot of traditional instruments, Greek instruments. Pretty sure her backup band was all from Greece. And um, there were millions of these records pressed. It's a double live album of uh, her British tour. And it's pressed by Phillips. Now, Phillips um, made some amazing pressings. The vinyl was high quality. The... All the engineering was good, good top top notch stuff, and um, and of course Phillips was you know a huge uh, multinational electronics and tube and you name it they were into anything to do with audio, and of course Phillips owned Mullard right. <laughs> Anyways, this is a great sounding record, and it's easy to find, but you want an early press, and you don't want one that's been played to death. Here's a much later record. This is the record that got Keith Jarrett's career off the ground and built a small boutique uh, record label, jazz label, up from nothing, ECM. And one day, a friend of mine walked in and uh, said, here, take a look at this, Jim. Have you got a copy of this? And I said, no, I don't have this. 
And he said, well, I've just got a second one at auction. He said, why don't you take my older copy? It's got, he said, the cover is not so nice. I bought it at a yard sale in, in Australia um, for, you know, like two bucks or something. And, but he said the vinyl is in good shape. So you take this copy. Well, he gave me the German press. <laughs> it's on ECM, of course. And um, this is a great sounding record. You might not be into piano jazz. It's not really my thing, but I love this record. It's, it's, I can't listen to Keith Jarrett's studio albums. They just, the life has been sucked out of them. <laughs> but that man came alive on stage. Uh, he really was a performing artist. A lot of artists are like that. And last up, we've got a fairly modern audiophile label. And this is one of my favorite Christmas records. I don't know if you can see that, but it says December. There was a, a, a series done seasonally by uh, George Winston. It's more piano, solo piano jazz. And it's done on the on the Windham Hill Records label, and um, most of what Windham did, I really don't like. It's not my thing. It's beautifully recorded and beautifully pressed, but it's just not my thing. And it took me years to decide that even though I, I owned a lot of great recordings and beautiful pressings, that I just don't listen to them. So I got rid of them all. And I only keep records that I like to listen to. And I think, you know, life is short. So don't keep music you don't like. <laughs> okay. So, what I wanted to say is that with vinyl, I don't have any examples. I got rid of them all. But with vinyl, stay away from the reissues. Most of them are pressed from digital masters. You might as well stream the high-resolution version of those digital masters. However, some records clearly declare the signal chain is A, A, A. And that means analog recording, analog mixing, and analog mastering. So even if the record was pressed last week, the signal chain is all analog. And that's what we want with vinyl. So watch out for those records. Otherwise, Source as early an original pressing as you can find. If the whole idea of making room for a turntable, carefully selecting a cartridge and phono preamp makes you break out into a sweat, then go digital. And in a future episode, we'll talk about digital recordings. Okay, what's happening over at Melatone Kits? Well, hang on a second. Let me get a prop up here. You know I love props. This is the amazing sounding E80CC kit preamp. This is the, uh, f this is build number one. It's no longer the prototype, it's actually, I'll just flip it over for a second for you. See how nice and clean the build is? That is how the build series was filmed, was, the, was putting this one together. So this is number one. The prototype is a lot sloppier looking because, of course, it got rebuilt. I think it got rebuilt seven, eight times, something like that. Anyways. And the big news is that the first E80CC test builder has successfully completed his kit. And best of all, he put an amazing review in the store. Thanks a lot, Brian. So go and have a look at that review. Uh, it's well worth reading. And between gaps in orders, last week has been was absolutely crazy. I'm working on a new prototype, higher powered monoblock. I've talked about this before, I think. I've already drawn up two completely different amps, so we'll have to see what gets built first. And you'll get I'll show you what our progress as I move it forward. And before we go, let's have a look and see what came in this week. It's been a fairly slow week, but a whole case, or almost a whole case, of a really nice tube came in. Hang on. I had my records perched on these. So, with Russian tubes, it's not that common to find them new in the box. But I found most of a complete case. This is the um, equi 
the Sovtech equivalent to the 6AS7G, um, and other, it, it's also known as the 6080, which is a slightly different tube. This is 6AS7G is, well, we'll see in a minute. Let's get it open. We'll talk a little bit about it. Sovtech, of course, was the Western name that Reflector used when they were exporting. Same thing as a Reflector. And Reflector made some nice tubes. Look at this thing, though. It's just absolutely gorgeous. It's a shoulder tube or ST type, and it's got a massive amount of waste chrome. It's got, can you see down there? It's got two saucer getters, which is very common for Russian tubes. And the gettering is just gorgeous. And of course, a large amount of gettering is a good sign. It means the vacuum is intact. It's also, in my opinion, a sign that the manufacturer was being really careful. These tubes are used a lot in direct um, coupled output stages, so they don't have output transformers. And I was looking at some of them, and I think one of the amps uses 16 tubes. <laughs> all uh, They're all tied together. Um, they're all working together to get their output impedance down. Because without an output transformer in between your speakers, you're you you you're got you got to do something. So, anyways, um, they're fascinating. It's a fascinating amplifier design, but a lot of um, direct coupled headphone amplifiers uh, use this tube. And in my opinion, with an experience with Russian tubes, it's the earlier Russian tubes that sound the best. The stuff that's being made today. It's really hit and miss. Some things, like the Genelux Gold Lion 12AX7s, are wonderful sounding tubes. But the vast majority of those reissued tubes, oh my god, meh, they really don't sound that good. These are all from, did they date them? Most Russian tubes will be dated, but the export ones, not always. Interesting, eh? So for internal use, they dated them, and sometimes for external use, they didn't. Anyways, there's a good chunk of a case in the store, and best of all, they're not expensive. Okay, if you stayed till the end, as always, here's some discount codes to help you out. Remember, I've got flat rate shipping of $20 around the world, and free shipping if your order is $150 or more after discount. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim from Vowels and More signing off. Cheers, everyone.